This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Wow. 1,000 episodes. I did not expect in 2012, and I can kind of remember starting this podcast in 2012, but I could never have imagined that I would get to 1,000 episodes. I'm one of the few people in the world where you can probably take my words, dump them into some kind of AI, and create an artificial intelligence Michael Covell right now. Take all my books, take this audio content, throw it into a blender, give me a new subject, and the AI mic can probably keep going on forever. That's kind of fun. I think that's my goal now. But 1,000 episodes is a cool number. It gives me something to shoot for. 2,000 episodes. Now, you might be thinking, who could I pick for episode 1,000? I can pick a lot of people a lot of really smart, influential people in my life. But I started to think, you know, what was the first trigger? The first trigger of my career. And that trigger was going to a Solomon Brothers interview in 1994. It didn't work out. Walking into a Borders bookshop, seeing Financial World's top 100 paid on Wall Street, And seeing a blurb in there about my guest today, Jerry Parker. And that just triggered me. That article, and I'm not going to quote it today, but that brief little paragraph said something like, Jerry was in Southern Virginia, he was using a trend tracking system, and he was trained. And that was the magic moment for me. I thought, well, I don't know this guy, Jerry Parker, but if he could get trained, why the hell can't I get trained? I just finished my MBA. I thought I had to know balance sheets and Warren Buffett and all that kind of stuff. But here in this one little magazine, one little article, this guy who lived 90 minutes from me, what did I do? I got in the car and I drove to his office. Guess what? He did not agree to meet with me. He did not agree to meet with me for 18 months. And finally, I sent him a fax. And the fax said something to the effect of the top 10 reasons You must meet with Mike Covell right now. A few minutes later, his assistant called me and said, you got 30 minutes on this date. I went down there, 1995, December, I believe, the first moment I met my guest today. That's really cool. That's fun. Because now he gives me the time of day today. I mean, I've tried to do a good job on my prior interviews with Jerry, but I'm very excited, as always, to bring on the most successful turtle trader. And if you don't know what a turtle trader is, you've got some kind of mental defect. Go figure it out. In all seriousness, my guest today is one of the legendary trend-following traders of the last 30, 40 years. What a great story. Today, I will take Jerry around all kinds of subject areas. There's no telling where we will go exactly. That's always the fun of a podcast. Just go off and see where you end up. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my 1,000th podcast episode with Jerry Parker of Chesapeake Capital, one of the original Turtles, and definitely the most successful of the original Turtles. I hope you enjoy. Nineteen eighty three. Could you imagine having a conversation with twenty twenty one Jerry and nineteen eighty three Jerry? What would that conversation be like? It would pretty much be you're setting your sights too low. <laughs> you know, you never really know what's going to happen, especially if good things start to happen. Incredibly good things. You could always just be so satisfied with what you know, what you expect. Life is always usually good, especially for a spoiled Americans. Life is good wherever we are, whenever we are, we're happy. We got big plans, big expectations. But in 
in my lifetime, your lifetime, one of the hallmarks has been it's really easy to exceed your expectations because of the way the world has evolved. Well, let me keep you at that 2021 to 1983, Jerry, and even get more specific. You've now become Mr. Prolific on uh, audio and video. When I first started chatting with you, probably in 2013 or so online, you had not been doing a lot of this at all, but now you're freaking doing as much as I am now, or maybe more, I don't know. But tell me about though, more specifically that 83 to 2021, I'm kind of noodling around the trend following world there, because I guess in 82, 83, you had some inkling about trend following, but that was a pretty big turn, a pretty big change in early 84 for you. And you contrast it today. Do you ever think back to like, what a wild ride? Yeah. From day one, I understood very clearly the opportunity that I had and we all had and how amazing it was because that's the biggest takeaway from the turtles is just, we were taught by these genius traders who could have probably done very well and made a lot of money in a lot of different fields. We started at the very top from the best. We had a pretty good expectation of what we were learning and where this could take us. And then all of a sudden you start making 100% a year, 200% a year. But leaving there and starting your own business and the managed futures industry would expand and CTAs would start getting lots of assets under management. Yeah, that was all sort of brand new about how it was all going to happen, honestly. Let me keep it at a thought about you though. I know you are very humble about these kinds of questions. So, okay, look, it's a great story. I've written a book about it, The Turtle Experiment, The Turtle Story, and a lot of people did well for a long time. But I think you're going to win the endurance contest when it comes to the turtles. Well, part of winning it is wanting to be in the game, even after you've made enough money. And then the second part is sticking with the principles. And I think that that's where I definitely deserve first prize in that because I did stick with the trend following principles. As I told you, one of the lessons I learned recently was that I think that my mentors were more interested and wedded to systematic trading rather than a trend following. It didn't have to be trend following for them, I don't think. All I did is I got experienced in the late 90s was just continue to trade longer term and extend my look back period and stick with the same strategy. Hardly no changes. I mean, I would do research and come up with changes but I would later say, oh, that wasn't a good change. I need to revert back and not add bells and whistles and unnecessary things to try to prevent drawdowns. I mean, that's where it all sort of comes in. You want to get rid of those drawdowns, but they're just sticking with those principles and just looking at the world in terms of trend following. Everything is just through the lens of trend following. I would even ask some of the turtles, like, I'm going to start trading single stocks versus indices. Some of their responses would be, oh, that's great because then you can add in some fundamentals or some other ways of looking at stocks and choosing stocks rather than trend following. And my response was, no way, I would never do that. So I just absolutely always refuse to give up on those bedrock principles that I learned in December of 1983. What strikes me about you and maybe some of the distance between, it's a little unfair, but it's like, okay, a small group of people, as you say, get taught by these genius traders. It's a great legendary story, but maybe some folks get unfairly positioned into slots. All that said, I've had a chance to know some of your peers and meet some, and I have often found that there were many, and some are no longer with us, that were highly emotional. And I find what's interesting when you talk about trend following is you're kind of talking like a Zen master almost. You're, you're very Zen about it. And I think maybe even though people, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, even though people could execute under the tutelage of Rich and Bill, that maybe when they're out on their own, they didn't really grasp completely. And I think you just said that a second ago. They didn't truly grasp what you just described, the emotional part, the living with it part. Well, I think that you can definitely dig deep into this topic. It can be explained very simply. And I have children who want to trade and they're all in their 20s and 30s, but let's say they want to trade and maybe they're not the most skilled in math or they're just preoccupied with other things that I can teach them, you know, buy here, buy this breakout, sell that breakout. And I think that to some degree, if they don't dig any deeper and understand even the math of it at all, they could probably make a nice living. You don't have to really get into it very much. And in some ways, 
if you don't dig too deep and you're kind of preoccupied with skiing or snowboarding or other things, I'll do my trades in the morning and then I'll go out and have my fun. Then you maybe not be tempted as much to try to change it. For me, it was, there is a lot of depth to it. And it was just like I was uncovering what it really meant and what the principles meant, especially as you apply them and you get faced with opportunities to not apply them. I've found that a lifetime spent uh, refining your trend following is a perfectly great use of your time. Other CTAs who sort of said, okay, I got the trend following nailed. I'll add mean reversion or I'll add pattern recognition, carry trade, and all these other things to it as if, well, the trend is done. I know how to calculate a moving average. So I'm done with that. I felt like, no, that's not exactly true. You can dive deep into this and at least learn a lot about what works and what doesn't work. The last year and a half, a really stellar trend following period. I know we kind of exchanged some emails. I had Don on from Purple Valley down there in Florida. For a long stretch there, we had a lot of people saying, you've seen this more than I, the trend following is dead meme. And all of a sudden, even you had some great trend following traders that we both respect who were saying there was a problem with trend following. And then all of a sudden, a guy like uh, Jerry Parker, who sticks to his knitting, but I know you're not running around trying to say to people, I told you so, I told you so, maybe a little bit, but you know, you did tell people so. Well, one of the big lessons since last fall, since it's been such a great move in so many of these markets, currencies, commodities, grains and metals, base metals, Bitcoin, lumber, some of these really stand out. Tesla, I was lucky enough to have Tesla in my portfolio. I think the big lesson, though, is it wasn't our fault. I think it could have been our fault to choose trend following. You cannot rely upon a method that has 5% of the trades are going to make all of your profit. And you've got all this diversification. You need to figure out when the commodities are not going to work and it's just load up in stocks and bonds. So that could have been a mistake to choose trend following and to choose diversification. I don't believe that. I believe in looking at all the data not just recent data and following the rules and not trying to figure out which regime we're in and burden your system and pollute your performance and your results with extraneous matters. The big lesson we learned is it wasn't our fault because we didn't have big outlier traits. And so we weren't doing anything wrong. Once again, apart from we shouldn't have chose trend following to begin with, possibly. Now we're all sort of humbled by what really pays the bills is these amazing trends that our main job during these trends is not to do anything. We bought the breakouts in October, November, the markets started skyrocketing. And as long as you didn't apply some sort of vol target or profit objective and just waited for your retracement and your trailing stop to be hit, which a lot of them haven't been hit yet, then you were going to do very well. And I think that's sort of the lesson is Sell your soul, sell out for the outlier, whatever it takes. That Tesla trade, it went up a lot initially, 50 ATRs. It retraced 49, <laughs> and now it went up 400. Depending upon your look back period, you could have definitely gotten out a few times if you're looking at the 50-day low or the 75-day low or whatever, which is fine. But if you have some longer-term stuff, that painful drawdown is just the price you pay for hundreds and hundreds more ATR profits. It just takes guts to do that and not to pick up the phone or pick up your laptop and dial in and take some profits. Let me keep you at a point that I did not follow up on when you were addressing that your two mentors early on, Rich Dennis and Bill Eckhart, that you would classify them as systematic traders, not necessarily trend following traders. But if I was to pick a little bit there, I would classify you as a systematic trend following trader, would I not? Oh, definitely. Why don't I let you explain what you meant by them being systematic and not necessarily trend following? At some point in time, like let's say the late 90s, the trend following, the shorter term stuff that we use as the turtles, that didn't work very well and hasn't worked well since. So my simple idea was, well, let's just see how if the 20-day low doesn't work, how does the 120-day low work? and just keep expanding your look back period so you won't get chopped up and whipsawed out of these large trends. With the cost being that when you do have the big trends, your trading stop is going to be far away and you're going to have a bigger drawdown. That's pretty easy 
And I think unacceptable for people who say, hey, that doesn't feel like a good risk return risk trade-off there. I'd rather look at something with a shorter time span, keep that two or three week look back. Your typical outlier might be 20 ATRs versus my typical outlier might be over 100 ATRs. And so I think that's probably what they were more committed to is, well, it may not look like trend following that we taught the turtles, but it will be systematic, rules-based, back-tested, and things like that. I think from day one of the turtles, it was pretty well known that Rich and Bill were skeptical about the future of trend following and the parameters and the way that they were teaching us. It was like, this may not keep working very long. And so I was like, what am I doing here? And so like before the turtle class was over, it was like a pessimism about how long this was going to last and work. So I think having that in your mind that you need to always be worried about that, sort of trying to evolve away from parameter sets that are too enticing for other people is a good mentality to have. And I've just settled it all by being so long-term and so willing to take ridiculously large drawdowns on profitable trades that I guess my assumption is it's not going to attract very many other smart people. The principal part of what you just described, even if the parameter sets change, and you've already said this, going for the 5% outliers and whatnot, but the principles, why do the principles stay? Why, for example, I mean, a long time ago, two really smart, legendary traders were pessimistic. And okay, maybe by somewhat luck, I don't know, but okay, one of their students said, well, this long-term stuff, I think there's something here. And now we roll forward multiple decades ahead. A lot of people that were around back in the day, older traders than you, they're no longer with us. So I guess the real question is, is something like trend following as you describe it, that 5% of outliers, and with generations, at least until we get life extension, generations always coming and going, it sure seems like If somebody can live the Jerry Parker portfolio and live the Jerry Parker strategy, they might be okay. Oh, definitely. I think one of the things that happened over the years was trend following started to change from what I would call the sort of the classic trend following one entry rule, one breakout entry, a breakout exit, and a stop loss as far as the signals go. Can't hardly beat that too much. Maybe you can throw in one other thing on the entry side. It started to change from let your profits run to what's the sharp. And we need to be very concerned with these return, our performance, daily performance, weekly performance, monthly performance rates of returns. And I think that it's hard to let your profits run if you're going to be concerned about your volatility of your returns. We've got the risk covered. We're taking these small losses. That seemingly is Great. You know, that's our money management. We diversify like crazy. We do longs and shorts, and then we take small losses. But then it was almost like what really changed was we need to pay attention to our volatility of our profitable trades. And if it's a drawdown on a profitable trade, they've been redefined as losses. What? (laughs) How does this happen? So just me rejecting that idea, I mean, there's no way to accept that and keep my philosophical head straight that you got to let your profits run. And profitable trades, you can lose hundreds and hundreds of basis points. Losing trades, 50 basis points, 25 basis points max. So this was, I think, the big change and one that impacted and affected everyone, almost to a person, except a very small group of people like myself who refused to give in to this sharp and vol targeting. I'm not sure if you're hinting at or saying it, but you know we had kind of talked a little bit in advance, and you mentioned the European trend following traders or European CTAs, and I'll let you define what you mean by that so people don't think it's necessarily a pejorative. You talk about European CTAs having trend following plus other stuff. The other stuff, like trend following is not good enough. You got to add the other stuff. I think that's really what you're getting at is that a lot of big name traders, people that I respect, people that you respect, did add a lot of stuff. And some of that's not worked out exactly right. There's at least two kinds of stuff. One is the ideas that I've mentioned before, pattern recognition, carry trade, short term, mean reversion, now maybe AI and machine learning and things like that to improve your trend following portfolio. 
is managed futures is maybe one of the few hedge fund categories, if it is a hedge fund category, that it's not good enough to allow allocators to allocate to pure trend. You need to create sort of a portfolio of strategies yourself in order to get assets. So that I never was really interested in. But I think that's the least offensive of the other stuff, which the stuff that's more offensive is the vol targeting and the paying attention to Sharp. And trend following is the one idea that Sharp has no place. Upside risk, downside, I don't know what you call it. It's ridiculous. You're letting those profits run, their profits, and your risk is these losing trades and how much you're risking per trade. And this is what I didn't like. And then these guys from the European CTAs that really hit it big, they were really great at building these great businesses. Hats off to the business aspect and getting the AUM. I think they kind of figured out that, well, if you want to have these big businesses and make a lot of money managing other people's money, you're going to have to take as much of the trend stuff as people can handle, and maybe add in, well, we have these PhDs, we're going to manage the volatility more. We are going to pay attention to Sharp. No one asked them to do that. No client was saying do that. It's sort of a marketing thing or a business thing where you can say, hey, you can stick around with these traditional trend followers with this big volatility, or we'll manage all of this for you into something that's a little bit more palatable and more scientific with all of our PhDs in different commitment to this traditional way of looking at markets, which is Sharp and volatility of returns. And it wouldn't have bothered me so much, of course. It's a great business opportunity to say, hey, I'll allocate to those guys and I'll allocate to people who do it a different way. And when I would go in and talk to clients or potential clients, I would actually say that we're one of the few CTAs that doesn't vol target and we just let the profits run and we trade single stocks and things like that. So you need to have both in your portfolio. But I guess some of them just could not resist trashing the turtles and sort of trying to build up a legacy of, well, when we got on the scene, we made things a little bit more scientific. And they would call themselves scientists as well, which I guess is okay. I would be a little embarrassed, even if I deserve to be one, to call my trading science. But I think that that's what got me going was the trashing of the turtles and sort of a simple way of doing things. And now watch us, we're taking it to a new level where in the long run, I knew it was not going to succeed better than a classic approach. I think what you're really getting at is got to be something really tough for investors. I don't know if I should say allocators, maybe allocators to some degree, but for investors is to really dig through the weeds to find those base principles and to understand the base principles and then to understand when someone or some group is doing what you are describing, the marketing to be able to decipher that. I mean, you've got a hell of a lot of experience to decipher it. I've got a little bit of experience to decipher it. But I think for the average person, the glossy write-ups and all that kind of stuff, it sways people. And it's really, it is a very, at its root, I think to understand what a Jerry Parker does, you've got to really get the philosophy first. To me, it seems it starts with the philosophy. What are the principles? Then you can get to the rules, then you can get to the execution. But someone's got to truly understand what you said at the beginning of this podcast is about the 5% outlier trades. And that's tough, I think, for a lot of people to understand when there's so many other people out there yelling and screaming about they've got the next new thing. The performance was great. I think there can be periods of time where sort of, in my opinion, doing the wrong thing and having suboptimal strategy can do very well. And especially if you have short-lived trends. There's been many trades over the years where I remember cotton would rally and it would make 15 or 20 ATRs and I would lose it all back. It would just crash the next week. And if you have a, what I would consider not a great strategy, but that takes some of those profits, you can have what looks like a better strategy. Just clients are weak and they want to buy into it. If you tell them and you can convince them that you can have what you want and I can minimize the negativity, they're all over it. No one wants to hear like eat more broccoli. And that's pretty much what we were saying the whole time. And their performance was better. And then I think coming out of two different camps, I'll never convince anyone, none of those people, that Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart gave us far superior systems and philosophy, but it's absolutely true. That's where we came from, which was basically trade for yourself. Maybe you'll have a few clients, but have a chip on your shoulder 
clients will always be tempting you to do the wrong thing. They don't understand. And the whole basis of what you do is it's hard to do and it's counterintuitive and letting profits run and accepting volatility is difficult. You need to be aware that whatever lurks out there is not going to brag on you and compliment your trading strategy. It's just going to make the most amount of money and be the most robust. The other guys, they were coming out of these big trading firms that had marketing departments and were raising lots of assets and with probably a minimum emphasis of research or trend following in general, moving average crossovers and things like that. And then we're kind of done. Now, how do we put together this organization? What is it going to look like that will attract people to give us lots of money? And so A plus for them on that. And that's why they have these big organizations and they're so much better at raising assets because that was their main goal was to raise those assets. It's an important distinction for people to try to understand. Difficult, never easy. Let me shift you to something though. I've been through your Twitter feed recently and for people out there that have not seen Jerry's Twitter feed, if you don't want to do all kinds of interesting research to find confirmation and backing to the philosophies that Jerry's talking about. He finds it and puts it on his Twitter feed. So I feel like I don't even have to think. I can just go there and it's always there. And you had one, I want to read this and I'll let you comment on it. I think you're quoting from somebody else, but it said the big blowups are typically caused by extreme intelligence that causes people to believe their own dangerous stories that you can predict with accuracy Use leverage because your prediction must be true. I'll let you comment on that, but I think also it would be interesting too is your thought that given to where we are right now with many markets extended, especially U.S. equities, there's probably a few of those lurking out there that could get pierced sometime in the future. They're doing exactly what you're describing, but the leverage is being hidden inside of bull markets. Yeah, that's a really good quote. I should have mentioned something about that because you asked me a question earlier and Really, I think what gets at the heart of that is how, for some people, trend following is so hard because you can add things to it. That makes it so great because it has that one rule, entry, one exit rule, one stop loss, and then we're done. And I'm saying you're done, and I'm sorry, but you're going to have some drawdowns from your open trades that are going to make you uncomfortable because we like that money. It's our money. We've already spent it. They even call a drawdown in an open trade a loss now. You take these smart guys with PhDs and you tell them, okay, you're finished. Now go market or something. They're like, no, I don't want to be finished. I can always improve and I need to get rid of these. This is what's standing out are these volatile periods. And so it's just very difficult for really smart people to say enough is enough and I can't improve upon this and just fall in love with this back test. I mean, I think that's the worst thing going is the back test. I like to look at the trade stats, the average win, the average loss, the win percentage, win loss ratio, and things like that. People tend to fall in love with the equity curve back test, going back to the 70s and 80s and watching how the markets go up and down and really take away some key clues from all of that, which I don't think there are any clues at all. It's to be ignored pretty much, except that if you're picking up on any risk in the future that you've seen in the past, just pretty much bank on that that's going to look worse in the future. And some of these firms would really make a big emphasis on research and change and evolving because this is what clients want to hear. But true trend following is we don't change. This is our problem is that we're always in constant search for more and more sample size. We must include the 80s and the 90s in our trade stats. And the world has changed a lot since the 80s and 90s. Is it still okay to use all of those trades? This really baffles people and makes people very nervous to not evolve and change over time. A lot of the industry, that's their main calling card. Watch us do our research and watch us evolve and change. And that goes against classic trend following. Well, classic trend following is taking advantage of classic human nature, which doesn't seem to change, does it? I don't think so. And it's looking back over all of that period of time and seeing that uh, you have these outlier trades and you're going to have this volatility and it's fine. It's not good enough for a lot of people for the computer to say to you, hey, if you risk 50 basis points per trade, these parameters are going to make the most amount of money for you. It's not good enough. Well, I need to eliminate some of those bad days and months because I'll be getting phone calls and complaints. Deep down, I think it bothers 
them just as much as it does the clients. They actually believe that targeting volatility and having special rules, special profits is something that they should do and want to do. I want to keep it at you for a moment. Obviously, I think anybody that has heard you before or seen you talk, they probably think to themselves, it seems like a pretty disciplined guy. And I know you're very conscious of health, fitness, your weight, and you have been for a long time. When you speak to your kids and they want to kind of learn about your routines and your habits, how are you talking to them? I mean, I'm really curious about the Jerry Parker discipline, the Jerry Parker ethos, because you probably did not have the same ethos about physical fitness and staying in a certain way. You probably did not have that when you were younger. What has allowed you and speak to this process of developing you? I think practice comes to mind. That's what the secret is. We all kind of realize that you can practice piano or your basketball. But all of these disciplines can be practiced as well. I remember when I decided to get in shape, I was uh, 40, and I had never been in shape a day of my life. And so I had no expectation, but I just started to realize that day after day, putting one foot in front of the other, you get better. You practice and you learn and you sort of figure out things that you thought were impossible or not impossible. It just gets better and easier every day. And that's that discipline. And then I was highly motivated by results. Once I started seeing results in trading or in diet and fitness, I ramped it up. I went extreme. You can even hear everything I talk about. I want to try to make it as pure and extreme as possible and kind of get to the core principle and be the one person who may be able to take it further and more in depth than maybe I should but at least talk about it in those terms and try to see if you can't push the limits as much as possible. When you first start out, you're not thinking about anything except let's lose five pounds. And then as it starts coming off, I was just getting more and more excited and going, okay, we got to go for a high school weight. And so I had never lost five pounds or 10 pounds <laughs> in my life. But as you start seeing success in implementing principles and understanding the principles of what works and doesn't work, you need to start pushing yourself to extremes that you never thought you should even imagine. And so I think that's what I'm good. I can get obsessed with things very quickly, trading, diet, and fitness, but then understanding the basics, learning over time, and listening to other people and saying, okay, this is something I haven't heard before. It doesn't sound like it fits with my philosophy, but I'm going to think about this and keep it on my list of things to explore And then maybe I'll get rid of it later or I'll incorporate it into my plan. I just felt like I was incredibly open-minded about anything people would tell me about trading or diet and fitness or any area I was interested in. I was just totally open. That's rare these days. Rich said many times that I think I could print my rules on the front page of the paper and no one would follow them. And I think he meant they were too hard to follow. Small losses, 40% win rate, let your profits run. But I think now I could print my rules on the front of the paper and everyone would just criticize them. They're too simple. You don't know what you're talking about. I studied this in college and you're not using Sharp. So I think that's the new way of looking at mentors and older people who've learned a lot is to argue with them, disagree with them. That's fine. I don't really care. I love a good argument. I try to foment arguments all the time on Twitter and get someone criticizing my views so I can kind of learn and hone my responses. Interesting about what you said about the practice and the experience of it. Okay, you don't know anything about fitness, you're age 40, you start to lose the weight, it comes off, and then some kind of like magical motivation happens because now you are personally experiencing it. That is very difficult to share with other people because it's the magic of experiencing it yourself And then all of a sudden, it's like, wham, bam, thank you, man. It just feels so good and you can believe in it. But it's tough to share with other people, isn't it? It's tough. I don't think I've had very many friends or family come up to me and say, tell me your secrets. I have had people come up to me and say, write down what you did. What do you do? And I could do that in trading as well. Write down all the things you do in trading or diet and fitness or whatever. And I did that once and I looked at the list and I was just shaking my head because it's not something you want to read up front. You want to take these baby steps. 
and figure it out for yourself. I just had a really nasty competitive streak that I could tap into. Once I got a glimpse of some sort of accomplishments that I had never thought was possible, it was the same thing with the turtles. I remember being obsessed with getting to 100 million. My friends were like, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just calm down and settle down? I'm like, no, 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 100 million. I got to get to 100 million. And so I was just extremely competitive and not happy if I was in second place or worse than second place, you know, as far as returns or relative return. So I was really a bad loser. Oh, I'm a hugely bad loser. Right when you said the phrase nasty competitive streak, I thought you were going to pause. And the next thing that was going to come out of my mouth was to ask you, because I could feel like the symbol shot right there. I just wanted to say, why are you so competitive? What made you so competitive? Like it was I mean, before you said it, I was like, oh, damn, he stole my thunder. <laughs> oh, man, I don't know what made me so competitive. Someone asked me on Twitter yesterday, did it come easy for you to be disciplined? And I said, no, it did not. And from day one with the turtles, I was probably the least disciplined. But in my interview with Rich, I was like, oh, I'm incredibly disciplined. Oh, yeah, we're all disciplined. We can all talk about it how disciplined we will be. Right out of the gate, I was probably the least disciplined of all the turtles, January 1984. But thankfully, I seldom got rewarded for my lack of discipline. So I was always chastised all the time, day after day. If I didn't follow my rules or my system, I could immediately almost see the downside of not following it. So I had no positive feedback. So I righted myself very quickly over the years to be better disciplined. But honestly, the amount of money that I've left on the table by not being 100% disciplined or even close to it is pretty sad. It's a sad story. We don't need to get into that. You brought up crypto earlier. Now, for some people, the uninitiated, and I don't know what percentage of my audience is uninitiated. I go all over the rainbow in terms of topics, but you brought up crypto. And of course, if someone, and I hopefully they do know about trend following, but trend following traders would know, okay, crypto, it's another market. Jerry can trade. Mike can trade, anybody can trade. And okay, Jerry's going to apply trend following principles to it. Speak to crypto. How did you make the decision? When did you make the decision that, okay, this passed the smell test for me, I'm in. And I'll let you also comment on crypto itself, because a lot of people are going to be thinking when I'm asking you about crypto and when you're responding that Jerry must be a crypto maven. You might be, but that really doesn't have anything to do with your trend following trading. That's right. I mean, that's 100% right. The answer to that question is always the same for every market, any market, and that is liquidity and diversification. So obviously, it's pretty diversified. No one even understands it. I have people tell me about it. And I still don't understand it. So then uh, that makes it less susceptible to deviating from a rules-based system. So I think to some degree, it's the perfect market for trend followers. You have no clue what you should do other than following your system unlike all the other markets where we sort of do have a clue, we think we have a clue. But I think what happened with uh, Bitcoin, I wasn't alone in this, is that all of us older guys who were looking at it and trying not to be left behind and having been burned so many times for being too skeptical about new ideas, we didn't know how to open up a Coinbase account. And then, oh my gosh, all of a sudden the CME comes up with the futures. Yes, I know how to trade futures. I have a lot of them in my account right now. I know where the CME is and I can put this thing on. I think that's probably one of the reasons that the cash futures spread got out of whack was because all the hedge funds and old guys like me were only interested in doing the futures and we didn't even know how to set up our coin base. I'm skeptical of Bitcoin in a sense that I think it could be a little dangerous in these crazy sell-offs. I'm not happy with that. It doesn't look like something too different from all the other markets I trade because there's been crazy sell-offs and everything, lumber and some of the stocks even. I've been around a long time and I've seen crazy volatility in the bonds and the British pound, for God's sake. So don't talk to me about crazy Bitcoin. It doesn't look any different, really. But I do wonder what's going to happen in the long term because I'm really always interested in being able to exit the trade. But I probably shouldn't be. But it's definitely in my portfolio. And that's another great thing about the markets since the 80s is the number of markets that are out there. My portfolio is so large now, over 100 markets. And so that makes me very happy. And I can take a lot of small risks in a lot of different markets. 
Bitcoin being one of them, and Ether pretty soon, I think. There's the futures on that. My friends tell me it's different and it's not 100% correlated to Bitcoin. So I'll probably be adding that as well. It is a little unusual in the sense that, at least when you started, okay, a lot of futures contracts on ags and metals and then currencies and stuff like that. I mean, Bitcoin could literally be a great trading opportunity. I'm not saying it is, but it could end up just being a scam. I mean, literally, that has to be one option on the table that it's a scam, but a scam that has got a ton of money in it and is very liquid and goes up and down and is legally traded on an exchange and is generally accepted by the public, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, anything's possible. I definitely read a lot about it and listen to a lot of podcasts. I know it's not a currency, so that I don't care about. I'm not sure what it is. I do have sympathy for people who like people in certain countries like Venezuela, who if they could have put their money in Bitcoin 20, 15 years ago, their life would be a lot better. So I do think that it is a great fail safe for crazy governments and fiat in extreme situations, but it's definitely has its own personality. It's not gold. It's not a currency. It doesn't need to be to have value. And I do think it has this I grew up in the 70s with Milton Friedman and monetarists and printing money, none of which matters anymore, I guess, or yet. But having that algorithm with a fixed amount of Bitcoin, that is pretty funny. It's pretty appealing for a kid from the 70s because that's what we were taught creates massive inflation is the ability to just keep printing and printing. So I hope it stays alive. I hope it does well. And I hope it expands into more and more diverse cryptos that are complement. So we can have a fifth currencies, commodities, stocks, bonds, crypto, 20 cryptos. That'd be fun. Speaking of extreme markets, I want to quote one more, maybe two more from your Twitter feed. And again, this, I think this is you quoting somebody else, I believe. But the quote was, even if markets are in a bubble, your position should be long until your trend following exit is hit. That's all there is. That's the rule. Nobody knows what the markets will do and where prices will be tomorrow, next week, next month, or next year. That is a really tough thing for people to handle that they might have, again, you spoke to the extreme intelligence. They might have this extreme intelligence and they have decided we are in a massive bubble situation in XYZ equities or whatnot. And they want to apply all that intelligence. But that's not the way it works. There's always going to be a person after the fact. And I'm not criticizing Michael Burry. He's a very smart guy. I love the movie. But there's always going to be somebody after a bubble burst that's going to be there and be that person that predicted it perfectly. You can't really build a life and a trading strategy around trying to predict the one bubble that's going to happen in your lifetime. It's almost like if you do that, it was such a rare thing and you may have been lucky that you should just walk away. I think some of those guys some famous ones, they made a lot of money in that period. And then they ended up starting hedge funds. And from then on, the hedge funds just lost money. Maybe all you have in you is that one big trade. I think we have a bubble in bubbles. That's another quote from someone else. I may have made all my life's fortune in bubbles. And so what? I mean, who cares? The market goes further than it should. It's crazy. And we rode the trend up. I mean, maybe that's why trend following works. That's fine with me. That quote is from my two friends, Moritz and Moritz. I think that the big issue with that is something I've learned over time. And that is you can't predict the markets. Not only that, but today's market has no bearing on tomorrow's. I've been in so many situations where the market closed on its high. It made an all-time high. I was making a ton of money. It closed on its high on Friday. And man, the weekend was just so much fun. I felt so awesome about myself. I'm at equity highs, this group of markets that closed on their high, it was a strong close. And of course, that was the high and it crashed from there and vice versa. I limit up one day, it could be limit down the next day. You think you see these patterns and you think that it's so obvious. I cannot believe I'm waiting to the 100 day low to get out of this thing. It's so dumb. Why am I doing this? All my friends are taking profits. And then all of a sudden, the market reverses and goes back up. It's just in the cards that that has to happen. To have a two-way market, to have a life where we all know prediction is impossible, it must, you are going to win on some of those situations by just following your strategy. And you're going to win overall. If it wasn't the right thing to do, the computer would tell you, don't wait until that 100-day low or that 200-day low. But 
you get enough of those reversals where it keeps going and makes new highs. So I think that's the lesson. Put your trades in in the morning and then don't look at them until the close. I love what you just said about making money in bubbles. What a great quote. We need t-shirts about this. The Jerry Parker t-shirt. So what? Who cares? Like, listen, you could write a book. If so, you could write a book explaining the depth behind the statement, so what? Who cares? Really? I mean, you know that. You know what I'm driving on there. There's a lot of depth behind that. Most people say, oh, that's just a throwaway from Jerry. Your voice was going down. It's not even that big deal. So what? Who cares? Is a huge, huge philosophical point. It's so funny to read what other people write about bubbles and the extended stock market. And they're so uptight about it. And they've been doing it for so many years. It had been wrong for so long. And I just sit back in my little bubble and just trend follow. And I don't really pay much attention to any of a reality. It's just what gets other people so upset and so uptight and their idea that this is what I need to unlock. I need to unlock the secret of these bubbles. But I think when I was in my 20s, I was like, I need to unlock the secret of staying on these trends. And it just came to me that that was what I should be really concerned with is capturing these outliers and not giving a twit about why and why they were outliers. And is it a legitimate outlier? Is it a legitimate move? I mean, to me, it's just a, such a waste of time. But to a lot of people, it means a great deal to them. But I don't really understand. I guess I've been a trend follower and a trend follower at heart before I learned about trend following. Yeah, that's definitely true. I definitely believed it before I knew anything about it. I was fertile soil for this incredibly magical experience that we had, the Wall Street Journal ad and then going to Chicago and learning I'm in my 60s, and so my memory is not as good as it used to be, but I do have a photographic memory when it comes to things that Rich and Bill said to me and said to the turtles. By the way, I think we've talked about this before, and I'm in the process of pulling it together, but I will share a copy with you when I've got it all pulled together. Is I probably single-handedly have got every last thing that was ever printed or quoted about that entire Wall Street history of the turtle. I'll have to share that with you one day. When I, I've got somebody working on it now. Who do you enjoy the most on Twitter? Do you have a couple names you want to throw out that you really like? I'm already telling people that they should go follow you and check you out, but who do you really enjoy on Twitter? Well, I enjoy Moritz Seibert and his buddy Moritz Hayden, Hayden, I think, and two quants. And then I enjoy Niels. Richard Brennan is really good. Morgan Housel, I quote a lot. Mark R. from John Henry, ex John Henry. Oh, I'm not going to let you get away with that. I'm not going to let you get away with it. You got to say it. Mark Rosemsky. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Rob Carver. I have a lot of loyal Twitter followers and Clubhouse. I'm on Clubhouse a lot now. I get a lot from those guys as much as they get from me. And like you said, I'm just pretty much searching for something out there in the news or study that I can twist into something that benefits trend following and putting that out there and quoting other people. One thing I did want to go back to that I keep forgetting I wanted to mention, I think this is worthwhile, is that I think that it would have been a much different experience for the Turtles if we would have stayed working for Rich a lot longer. In hindsight, the mentorship that we got was so important. It was more than just the rules. I've sort of used this bad analogy of here's a manual, now become a Marine. It's not possible. I mean, the manual is necessary, but you're not going to become a Marine without the boot camp. Here's the list of rules for the turtles, but getting that list from Rich and Bill and having those four years is indispensable. And another four years or five or 10 years would have been so much better. And I think the legacy of the turtles would have just benefited so much in terms of trading and discipline and business and so I think that that is something that is not to be dismissed, is that we would have been much better at our job if we'd had more time with those guys. The time that we had was indispensable for our success, not just the rules. And that's just maybe coming over and talking to us like once a month or less, but just knowing that they had your back. Navigating the markets in the 80s and the 90s with those guys would have just been a big benefit for us, for sure. Can I push back just a second? I've already kind of laid you out as the guy that's got the endurance, the guy that's kind of like stood the test of the time from the turtle experience. But I think 
there would definitely be some people in the class with you, the two classes, that maybe they did really well under Rich and Bill's tutelage, but maybe they weren't cut out for it necessarily? Or do you think that if everybody would have stayed much longer, as you just theorized, that that would have helped some people that just needed more time? Yeah, possibly. Like I said, I think going through the markets and just living with the trades and the trends and the losses, we had four pretty darn good years where we made a lot of money. So going through some of those bad years and maybe a losing year or two with those guys and spending more time, maybe changing the environment a little bit, like everyone leaving the office and working from home or Virginia and Florida and New York, and then coming back together once a quarter for an update and that sort of thing. Maybe that would have been good. I think the environment, everyone being in the same room, that had a not always had a hugely positive impact on people's trading and their creativity. Rich wanted some creativity from the group, and I don't think he got very much creativity and new ideas. So it could have changed a bit. Going through the tough periods with those guys, I think would have helped everyone. Will your football team get another one this year? Tampa is really having some good fortune. And at some point, I felt like you had to make a choice between Brady or Belichick. And I chose Belichick. Brady will be nothing without Belichick. I remember going to the Super Bowl and sitting down and going, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. If he wins this thing, this is amazing. I'll never bet against the GOAT and Tom Brady. It's so much fun to be in Tampa with the Lightning and the Rays and the Buccaneers. It's a magical time. It's a great place to live. I just love sports. Do you get to see any NFL? Yeah, I catch up. I tell you, though, I think with Brady, it's going to take a handful of years before we all appreciate how crazy it was to leave New England, go to Tampa, and pull it off in your first year. I just don't think that story gets enough credit as to how amazing from a sports perspective that is. It's just truly, it's one of a kind. I mean, that's not going to be repeated. Nothing like that. He might repeat it. He might do it again, but no one else is going to match him. Yeah, no, he's an amazing person. No doubt about it. He is easy to root for, especially if you live in Tampa. I'm a big fan of reading books, studying successful people. And I think he's a guy who obviously has a process and he talks about his process of being in shape and leaving nothing uncovered, paying attention to the smallest details. So he's a guy who would probably fit in with trend following because I think he loves the process, wedding himself to some basic time-tested philosophies like I do. Jerry, everybody can find you easily on Twitter. It's always curious to me that when I want to pull your Twitter up, if I go to Google, it must be a very rare name because if I type in Jerry Parker, you always come up one, two, or three. Even though it seems like a very kind of name that's very common, Jerry Parker is very unique. It's just, it really is. It always pops up. You don't even have to give your Twitter handle. If you just type in Jerry Parker, you're going to find you on uh, Google really fast. Is there a website you want to send people to, Jerry? And also, you mentioned Clubhouse. Is that a private thing that you've got, or is it only by invite right now? No, no, no. Clubhouse is open. We have 2,000 members, Trend Following Trading Club. I would say probably half of those are from India for some reason. So Indians, I think, like trend following and process and systematic trading, it seems like. Clubhouse is a great venue to talk about trend following trading and ChesapeakeCapital.com and Twitter is great. I saw the Indian switch in my world just in the last three or four years. All of a sudden, just India's like online into trend following. Wham. Good insights. Jerry, I appreciate it. Hopefully we can talk again in the future. So far, you keep talking to me. I guess I've not done anything too wrong yet. I really enjoy you and I appreciate all that you've done and all your research and all your archives. And I would love to get my hands on some of those things and see this new book or project you're involved in with the turtles. So thanks for all you've done for us. And likewise, whenever I type in trend following, you come up. So that's a good thing. Yeah, they had to change all the names of the strategy to something else because if they kept with trend following, they were just helping me. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Hey, Jerry. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone 
and answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.